Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Poker people, you're missing out if you skipped episode 66, where I taught you a basic hand reading and how understanding percentage form can lead to assigning more accurate preflop ranges. Hey, poker people, thanks for tuning in, thanks for your Patreon support, and thank you for spreading the word, because that's how this show grows. It is Friday, the 27th of May. Raise your hand if you're watching X-Men Apocalypse this weekend. Cool beans, you and me both. I am super excited to see Quicksilver back for some more, as well as Psylocke. Hubba hubba, know what I mean? I cannot wait. Alrighty then, today I am featuring three questions from some lovely poker peeps, so let's get to it. Visit today's show notes at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod67 for links to everything I discussed today and to join the Smart Poker Study Nation. So this email comes to us from Dave, a self-professed donk. I swear I didn't call him a donk. He did it to himself. Here it is. Sky, I am a donk. See? Where do I begin with my studies? I have many, many of the old school books. Sklansky, Caro, Brunson, Malmuth. But so much has changed. I love your podcasts, but some of the concepts, especially the math, is over my head. I am going to purchase the Ed Miller book, The Course. You have done a great job presenting it. Please help! From Dave. All right, well, thanks for the compliment and the question, Dave. The very first place to start is to understand what hands are profitable to play from each position and to create your own ranges that you follow as you play. You mentioned that you're going to get Ed Miller's book, The Course, and I'm so happy to hear that. It is an incredible course. In the very first chapter, he discusses the considerations he puts into creating his own hand ranges and how they increase in size as the position gets later. And please, for everyone listening, go back to podcast number 22 and uh, listen to me discussing this chapter. You know, I would recommend following Ed Miller's recommendations exactly. Follow it to the T for a few weeks. If you've never thought about hand ranges before, then strictly following his really uh, what I would consider well thought out ranges. Uh, Following those ranges will save you brain space as you play. You're so better off in the beginning, not wasting any time and you know, your brain capacity, your brain space. Don't waste any of it with every hand dealt while you answer a question like, should I play this a six offsuit here? What about this 10 eight offsuit? What about this king four suited? You know, once you get used to the ranges that he gives you, you can start to add or subtract hands that you feel comfortable or uncomfortable playing. So the next thing you should do, Dave, is get a program like Equilab from PokerStrategy.com or Flopzilla. And Flopzilla, of course, costs a little bit of money, but it's worth every single penny. And next week, I'll really hit Flopzilla hard in episode number 68. But these programs allow you to calculate equities of hands and ranges and can give you insight into the strengths and weaknesses associated with the hands that you choose to play. If you don't really understand how weak ace-10 off is compared to ace-10 suited, then you're in for a real treat here, you know. And Flopzilla is especially good for hand-reading opponents when you eventually get to working on that skill as well. So I really recommend you start to work with some of these poker softwares that help you um, estimate or, you know, help you learn about equities. So for your question about poker math, the most important math to remember, and you can actually use this in just about every hand played, is the break-even equation. And that is the break-even point equals the bet, or the call, divided by the total pot with the bet or call included. So here's a question for you. How often do you have to win to make a profitable river call? Well, the profitability equals your call divided by the total pot after your call is added. So, for example, you have to call 4 to win a total pot of 20 with your 4, you know, $4 call included. And so, 4 out of the 20 means you need to win 20% of the time. So, another question is, how often does your 3 bet bluff have to work? Well, once again, it's bet divided by total pot. So for example, you bet 5 to win a total pot of 15 with your bet added to it, and so that's 33% of the time. And another question, how often does your draw have to hit in order to make a profitable call? Well, once again, it's call divided by the total pot. So for example, you have to call $3 to win a total pot of $10 with your $3 call included, and so of course that's 
30%, 3 divided by the 10. So make sure you listen to podcast numbers 17, 45, and 55 for lots of math goodness. And something else for absolute beginners to start uh, to help you improve your play is you need to have a reason for every bet you make. This is a leak that many players have. And uh, if you don't know, your bet should do one of the two things. You're either trying to get players to fold better hands or to lay down good draws, which is bluffing. Or you're trying to get players to call with worse or pay too much for the draws, which is value bidding. Once you start to think this way, your bets will be more successful as you'll automatically consider how strong your opponent's hand likely is. Listen to podcast number 49 for more on this leak of betting with no reason. Alrighty, party on, Dave. Okay, so this next question comes to us from Big T, who we've heard from before. It was a rather long email with two questions, uh, so I'll shorten it a bit today. I'll hit the first question, then give it an answer. Then I'll hit question two, then answer that, because they're completely different questions. If I read through the whole thing, you'll forget question one by the time I answer it. So uh, here it goes. Hi, Sky. Thanks again for your answer about the pocket pairs a few weeks ago. I am playing them more often now, not always successfully, but it made me win a few big pots I was very happy about. So question one, I'm playing online poker only on Bovada. So do I really need a HUD? And if so, why? Alrighty, so for this first question, Big T, uh, for those who don't know, Bovada is an anonymous site. You're just playing with you know, player numbers instead of names, and the player numbers change with every new tourney or cash table that you're at. Uh, on one table, you could be player 10. On another table, player 20. On another table you know on another tournament table your player 845 you know so this makes it so you can only accumulate statistics on a player during the current session that you're playing with them uh, after the session ends you'll never see i mean you'll see that number again but it won't be related to that same player and i don't think you need a hud for any site at all for playing online anywhere but as long as you know how to use it properly you will be better off as an mtt player uh, which you are big t you might play anywhere from 20 to 200 hands with any one player, depending on how lucky you are that your table doesn't break up or that you're, you know, that you're not moved or your opponent isn't moved. And even over just 40 hands, you can get a really good read on an opponent's tendencies. The most useful HUD stats over small sample sizes are VPIP, raise first in, three bet, attempt to steal, fold to steal, C bet, and fold to C bet. If you were using a HUD with lots of different stats, like 4-bet and went to showdown and won money at showdown and donk the river, that kind of stuff, uh, those stats wouldn't be so helpful over small sample sizes. But if your HUD just contains the stats I previously mentioned, then you'll be better off than if you didn't use a HUD at all. So I recommend using one. And even if you want to use it only for VPIP, PFR, and 3-bet, if you use it just for those three things, even over 20 hands or 40 or 50 hands, you get a very good sense of the player type that you're up against. And of course, for player types, uh, you can listen back to episode 12 of this podcast for a whole lot on player types. And uh, oh, plus poker tracking software is also good for storing hands for review off the tables. And even if you don't do so now, having a database of hands that you played, uh, you know, and using this database for analysis for leaks um, or for opponent leaks or just to work on your game or your game this database is extremely valuable so that's another reason to have a hud or have poker tracking software even if you don't use the hud at least you're saving hands for future study Alrighty, so we'll go back to the email for question number two this one is a hand history review so in the email he gives an explanation of the hand and then he actually post the you know the text the text copy of the hand too so i can see all the details i'm not going to read it all entirely but if you go to the show notes for this page you'll actually see his explanation as well as the uh, exact hand history for the hand so uh, here's his explanation here there's one early position raiser we'll call him player a another short stack player b calls i three bet on the button with ace queen off the blinds fold and players A and B both call. So I'm in position three way and the flop comes ace of clubs, eight of spades, queen of spades. The pot is 2,700 chips. Player A has 2,100 behind, B has 1,000 behind, and I have 1,600 behind. So you can see that the stack to pot ratio, not even one to one, you know, the pot is bigger than all the stacks behind. And uh, oh, he had ace queen preflop, so he flopped top two pair. Uh, with a flush draw on the board. So player A goes all in and he covers me and player B, the short stack, calls the all in. I knew that 
player A had a flush draw. Not sure if it was a reasonable guess, but it was what immediately came to my mind. And it was easy to say it was a good guess now. Uh, I suspect that player B has a flush draw as well, even though I thought he might have called with an ace. Either way, it doesn't matter since I think the player who's covering me is already on a flush draw. I call. The turn is another spade, and I know that I'm out of the tournament. B ends up winning the pot with a better flush than A. Now that I'm reviewing it, I realize now that A also had a straight draw. Uh, the action went fast during the actual game, and I hadn't noticed that. So this leaves me with a few questions. So here's his questions. Should I risk my tournament knowing that a spade on the turn or river means I'm out? I thought the odds were good, but I'm not sure, but I'm still not sure I should have called with two pair. Question number two. Is there any other mistake I made? And question three, I would probably not call a 3-bet preflop with 10-jack suited or ace-3 suited as my opponents did, especially not if I were a player A and didn't know what player B would do. Am I wrong, and should I call 3-bets more often when I'm in their position? Thanks again for your podcast, Big T. Alrighty, Big T. So so for question one, you had asked, uh, should I risk my tournament life knowing that a spade on the river means I'm out? Well, for one thing, a spade on the river doesn't necessarily, on the Turner River, doesn't necessarily mean you're out if you happen to boat up along the way on the Turner River. So even if they do hit a spade for the flush, you still, you still have some outs there. But to answer your question about making the right call, absolutely, you were right to make the call. Looking at the pot odds that you needed to win, your all-in call of 1,700 chips, about 1,800, was going to win a total pot of 7,200. So looking at that break-even math that we talked about earlier, 1,700 to win 7,200, you only had to win about 25% of the time, you know? The flush and the straight draws will only complete about 40% of the time, meaning that you're going to win 60% of the time. And I calculated this by the outs that they had. You know, seven spades and three kings was 10 outs. Uh, out of the 43 cards remaining in the deck and that will only hit about 40 percent of the time so you were winning 60 you only needed to win 25 you were good your call was perfectly fine i would fault you if you didn't make the call in this case um so question number two and i'll repeat the question is there any other mistake i made so uh, i think the mistake that you made was not three bet shoving preflop your 3-bet and their calls made the pot 2850, 2800 chips, but you only had 1785 behind. You can see that player B in the middle position only had 960 chips behind. Normally at less than 20 big blinds, my 3-bets are shoves because of this stack-to-pot ratio problem. On the flop, you had less than a pot size bet in your stack. You would have been better off 3-bet shoving pre-flop. Most likely, they both would have folded and you would have still been in the tournament, or they would have called and you had... Um, you had ace queen and that dominates the ace three suited as well as it has a very good equity versus the jack 10 suited, you know? So your third question was, I would probably not call a three bet preflop with 10 jack suited or ace three suited. Am I wrong? And should I call three bets more often when I'm in their position? So I think that they made decently profitable calls preflop because of your sizing. You only made it about two and a half X or so. If you would have made it three X, uh, their calls would have been much less profitable. In general, their plays here are losing plays because they're calling out a position. Player A called with player B still to act, and they both called with really marginal kind of hands you know jack 10 suited and ace three suited don't play too well out of position versus a three bet now the under the gun player a he could call and shove any flop making for an often profitable stop and go play but other than that they should both fold to your three bet due to stack sizes and the weakness of their hands they are getting good implied odds to continue so alrighty, thanks again for those questions big t and it's time for a Patreon plug. If you support me on Patreon, you can get some exclusive poker strategy content that I won't deliver anywhere else. There are different levels of support, and with each level comes different rewards. You can get over-the-top podcast shoutouts, early release podcasts, extra patron-only podcasts and videos, copies of my future ebooks, and more just for supporting me with a small monthly contribution. There are also some crazy goals that I've set. Help me hit these monthly goals and you'll hear more strategy content in the form of more questions answered, longer podcasts, or even more frequently scheduled podcasts. Who knows, with your help, I might be podcasting five full days every week. And remember, supporting me on Patreon could lead to you having a free roll, 1% or 2% of my Colossus winnings coming up next weekend. The first place prize is guaranteed at $1 million, so you could be looking at 10 k or even 20 k just for a small part of your bankroll supporting me every month. Please visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy for more details.
Okay, so on to today's final question. This one again comes from Fyraga, and it ties a little bit into supporting me on Patreon. Sky, I'll be very happy to pledge my support in the near future once I can take care of some personal financial goals. Can you give me uh, more insight as to what strategy videos and or ebooks might cover? I don't know how far in the future you plan your projects, but I am interested in hearing about it. Also, have you enjoyed using WordPress? I am considering using them for hosting a blog, part of my being accountable for my goals, but I am hesitant to commit to a site. Also, super quick update. I decided that Heads Up Sit and Goes are the best game for me right now. And for everyone listening, if you don't remember, Fyraga was the one that asked about which discipline to stick with for future profitability and poker longevity. And Heads Up Sit and Goes combined my desire. Oh, he continues with Heads Up Sit and Goes combined my desire to learn cash game concepts. All decisions are based on chip EV, not ICM, and hand reading with my knowledge of push fold poker and turbo hyper turbo experience. Early results are favorable, but too early data excited. Thank you very much for your last email. Best regards, Fyraga. Well, thank you very much, Fyraga. For my first ebook, it will be a book related to studying poker and will cover all of the techniques that I use to get the most out of my time studying. Future ebooks will cover things like the most important topics to master in order of importance. And you might have heard me mention this, uh, you know, when I talked about minimum effective dose before. And actually, I did a full podcast on minimum effective doses, and that was podcast number 20. 24, which was a Q&A podcast. The videos will be on different topics, and they'll all cover things that I will only release there, not in my YouTube channel nor through the podcast. And for the other question, I currently use WordPress for my w- website. It's super easy to use, but you know I do have zero coding experience, and with WordPress and all the available plugins, I find it super user-friendly. Um, from my understanding, once you own a domain and create a site, all that content is still yours. So if you don't like the platform, you can migrate everything to another. And, you know, truthfully, I don't know about the logistics of doing that, but I'd, you know, I would imagine that there is a way to take your WordPress site and move it over to Squarespace, for example. But do some research first before you do make a final selection. But I would recommend WordPress. It's the only one I've ever used and it's, it's easy to use. So good luck with the heads up, sit and go play as well. It is a tough discipline, but I think it'll be super helpful for every poker player to improve their skills. Some of the best players in the world are heads up, sit and go specialists or heads up cash specialists as well. So I hope to see you competing with them someday. And thanks for those questions, Fyraga. Now it's time for a poker review. As you all know, I'm heading to the Colossus this year, and at PokerNews.com, there's a great article about the adjustments they made to the tourney structure for the Colossus this year. 30-minute levels instead of 40 last year, with antis kicking in early, and a level being skipped entirely. You know, the article talks about how crucial it is to get active early and how accumulating blinds and antis early on will be totally key in the tournament. Don't late reg, and make sure you're on time, because by the end of the third level, if you're still at starting stack, you'll only have... 33 big blinds and it only gets more expensive from there of course if you're heading to the colossus i suggest you check out the article i link to it within the show notes and poker news is also putting out lots more articles for those traveling to the wsop this year uh you know and those articles have lots of good tips on how to make the most out of your trip just visit pokernews.com for the strategy articles and i also link to them within the show notes Thank you so much for listening, and thanks again to Dave, Big T, and Fyraga for the questions featured today. I hope my answers boost your poker skills. And if you're not already there, and why wouldn't you be, head over to the show notes page for everything discussed today at smartpokerstudy.com slash pod67. Hit me with any feedback through the show notes, send me an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com, tweet me at smartpokerstudy, or hit up the Facebook group at Study dot com slash discuss and if you have any questions you'd like featured in the show send it on in through any of the channels just mentioned and hey don't forget about my colossus free roll for listeners sign up for the newsletter or support me on patreon for your chance at a free one percent or two percent of my colossus winnings first prize is guaranteed to be a million bones so that could be a free 10k or 20k for you Alrighty, poker people, be sure to come back for Tuesday's podcast where I continue the Hand Reading Lab series and dive into the benefits of Flopzilla, how it helps in hand reading, and the many other uses of the software. Of course, word of mouth is the best advertising, and I thank you for sharing this show with other poker people. It only grows with your help, so I'm asking you to share it with someone who will get value from it just as you do. Send them to the show notes page to get them started on all that this podcast has to offer. 
And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to support the show and collect some nice monthly rewards. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.